Little really? Bit. Would, would you say book? <laughs> yes. Oh, on chart. Yeah. Oh, if you look at the chart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're looking yeah, at yeah, yeah, uh, that's, SPY, uh, S&P 500, the uh, macro chart for SPY, the U.S. equities index, kind of, um, you know, what everybody's looking at to, to generally gauge the health of the market. Uh, so, you know, you got your, uh, your uh, dot-com bubble, your 08 mortgage-backed securities bubble, and then you've got uh, the 08 quantitative easing. Uh, me and Roman were kind of talking about, you know, how a lot of the older guys, uh, you know, who, who were trading the market during the dot-com bubble have different types of perceptions than some of the guys who weren't around during that period, right? Because, you know, if you just look at the top of the dot-com bubble, right, it didn't really break above that high on any significant level until... 13 years later. So if you endured this, right, if you were uh, in your 30s during this period, you have a, a very different perception of the market than somebody who was in their 30s during this period. And so there's just a natural disconnect there. Um, and, you know, people are constantly, you know, whether they're aware of it or not, linking the current moment in the market to some previous moment that looks familiar to them. And so it's, it's pretty, you know, it makes sense why somebody who maybe was, you know, got hit pretty hard and has PTSD from, uh, from the OA, you know, dot com bubble or OA crash might be looking at this and like, you know, it's giving them flashbacks and that type of thing. Um, but that's, you know, I consider that a trading error, right? That's just not, they're not connected in any way. They're not related in that way. Um, so I think kind of the most important thing on this chart essentially is to mark off what happened right here because that's where, you know, the market changed, right? So um, this is one of those things, whether you call it a black swan event, people don't, I would refer to it as a black swan event. People don't necessarily use that term to, to refer to something that makes the market go up, right? Typically when they're using the term black swan event, they mean that the market went down. But it is a black swan event in the sense that it's so crazy and so wild and it destroys all the previous models. It's that crazy, right? So this moment in time is the 08 financial crash where basically the world changed the type of currency debasement that came out just changed the world. And it's the type of thing where when something like that happens, everything on the left side of the chart no longer matters at all, like zero. It, its relevance is literally zero because uh, you can see that here. I mean, oh, just go to Twitter and search Fed balance sheet. And uh, first thing that pops up, this is a Bloomberg terminal. And you can see here, right? What I was just mentioning earlier is pretty obvious if you look at this chart, right? That's where the Fed balance sheet really started to take off. And you know, kind of, um, yeah. So this is why, you know, a lot of guys who were trading during the, you know, this time they were, you know, maybe they were value investors, which was a good strategy back then. And they would look at, uh, PE ratios, um, you know, discounted cash flow models. And, you know, you talk to some of those older guys now and they're like, they're looking at the current market and they're like, dude, these PE ratios are the highest they've ever been by like, you know, whatever, but they don't realize that what happened here broke that PE model. So they're using a model that's no longer relevant. Um, because you they see, don't... I got, I got a lot of difficulties to, to keep up with it, you know, honestly. Yeah. And so really this is reality, right? Yeah. I mean, the, these, you know, these, these chart, I guess, if you start to factor in QE with that, it perfectly makes sense why for the last 12 years, we have never seen inflation because QE was deflationary by nature. Whether you believe it or not, it was deflationary. QE was deflationary. Wait, could you explain that? My, my, my little brain does not compute that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, there, are, there are videos I can post to you if you really want to start to dig into it. But essentially, if you think about what happened, I mean, Anthony is completely right. What happened in 2008 was a, was a black swan event. Uh, nobody, th nobody thought it could happen, but yeah, as many other things, it, it, it happened. Okay. But I think 
it's misleading to just look at the Fed balance sheet because you need to think about, you know, I guess you can look at whatever form of, you know, quantitative uh, measurement of the monetary supply, but it doesn't really make any difference if that supply it doesn't go out there in the real economy. And what happens with QE, it's basically a creation of reserves, banking reserves, and a swap in reserves in between the commercial banking system and the Fed. So that money never floods in the real economy. That's why you needed to have not only one QE, but QE2, QE3, QE4. And guess what? Even if the Fed target rate of inflation was 2%, for over a decade, they were never able to achieve that. And there's a reason for that, because there was still a dollar shortage in the system, because those money was just a reserve created and swapped, even overnight, if you think at the repo market, in, inside the banking system. They never floated in the real economy. That's why you never see you, ne you never saw inflation for the last decade up you until have, now. Okay. So you're, Sorry, but, yeah. so you're saying that the inflation that we're seeing today was basically the COVID paychecks. This is the the plus. We could say that uh, there's problems no. with retail and there's thing parts that are harder to get and so forth and so forth. So that kind of high heightens the price of well, everything. There is there is a lot of factors at play obvious? which what what I think Roman you're absolutely spot on. I don't understand why it's not obvious. Because to me, the black swan thing, I have an issue with that as well. If there's a pandemic, we know there's gonna be a dump. Surely, surely we know there's gonna be a dump. The only black swan part of it, we don't know when it's gonna happen. All that's happened is it it's accelerated something that was going to happen. So the point that the left hand side of the chart is irrelevant. I don't see it as irrelevant at all. It's just you have to amplify what's happened on the right hand side of the chart. On, on the right hand well, side. What I meant point. by that is that the models that they used prior to 08 no longer work. Right? So if you try to apply a oh, model from, from prior to yeah, 08. We can all agree, the, we can all agree with that. Yeah. Uh, that, that's what I meant by that. And so kind of to what Roman's saying is that, you know, um, that the money is staying within the Federal Reserve. Well, that's, you know, on one hand, that's that's accurate. But on another hand, what are they doing with that money? They're, they're giving it to they're buying uh, mostly, uh, uh, you know, government bonds. So that money is not staying in the it, it's, you know, <laughs> the government is taking that money and you know spending it and same thing when they buy mortgage-backed securities from banks uh what, what do you think banks do with that money they they nothing know. no banks. If you, look, you can you can you can go and look at the data of lending growth if you don't lend in an economy in a financial system which is based on debt if you don't have lending growth you don't have creation of new dollars you yeah, don't but, have inflation yeah but you do have lending that's the thing it's like you have the the easiest period of credit you have it now. we've ever had. And that that is how the money is created, right? Because you right, you issue a, a loan to somebody in the market, say you're just issuing a million dollar loan. Well that all that money is money inflationary, right? Because it didn't exist previously. You created that's that's how the inflationary effect is is created. And what the Fed's doing is they're taking those uh, institutions who are lending like that, right? Who so they're directly inputting money in the economy, like the government, the banks. And then what the Fed's doing is they're managing their risk, right? By, by basically having a put that any, you know, any risk, they'll just buy that risk asset. No, I, I mean, I, I totally disagree with that. And I don't believe that's what happened in the last decade. We didn't have m money injected into the economy. It was just a financial banking system. And that's it. Okay, but if they issue loans to like when they issue when a private institution issues loans, right? They're creating new money. That's how inflation's really done. So, if 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 you issue if Morgan Stanley right issues a uh, billion dollars in new loans to business entities or corporations, that's a billion dollars that wasn't previously in the economy. So you know, the counterpoint is. Where are those money in the real economy? Because if they are out there circulating, they should produce some effect. 
Well, the thing is, you, normally, you okay, have so, never the, seen so you, one on one hand, you're right, right? You're, you're normally like if it, if Morgan Stanley was a was going to issue a billion dollars into the economy, normally they would have to collateralize that, right? And have some type of collateral. How do you collateralize that? They don't need to. There's there's no banking collateral right now. So there is no banking collateral right now. Do you do you have a look? Did you have a look at the Basile agreements? Well, the system is much more collateralized now than what it was before 08. Well, what I, we basically well, shifted from an uncollateralized system of credit system by a collateralized one. Okay, but they're collateralized by everything now is collateralized. Yeah, by US by when you say collateralized, yeah. are we talking about the the reserve ratio that banks need to have a certain percentage of reserves? Yeah, to, so, and, uh, so you, Roman, basically you need you need to offset any liabilities with a with an asset. Usually it's treasuries. Yeah, but they're okay. They're, this is fascinating. I'm actually they're really collateralized by <laughs> by uh, US Treasury securities, you know. And, so mostly, yeah, mostly, which, yeah. which isn't real collateral, right? It's just made up money. It's not real collateral that this way we're well, talking. Uh, so we're like kind of the, right. The Fed is just buying up these securities that are used as collateral for these loans, but th there's no real collateral. It's not like they're using gold to collateralize their loan or using Bitcoin to collateralize. Oh, loan. okay. Oh yeah. All right. If you put it that way, of course, we are still running on the assumption that nothing is backed by nothing okay i get that yeah but if you look at the legal side of things right you, if you have a liability even if you go to your local bank and you deposit a check your bank you need to go out there on the on the open market and buy up uh, what as whatever type of asset to offset that liability yeah which is typically u.s treasuries yeah, by, because by large, we, yeah. we've seen how it played out with, yeah. you know, the mortgage backed security, you know, eight. Everyone was thinking that was good money. That was a solid asset. And turns out well, it was not. Well, that's why so the, the now Fed if you, has even if to you look at the repo market. Yeah, that's why the Fed has to support those markets, right? Because the, they have to collateralize the banks with fake money. So, yeah, essentially what they're, yeah, but I, I okay. I totally get your point. I, you I think saying? we are kind of reaching some sort of a convergence. <laughs> Basically, we are kind of saying the same thing. Just um, for me, the problem is that if you look at these uh, chart uh, on Twitter with the Fed balance sheet, okay, and I totally agree, this is fake because those money are not real money, yeah. and it's just finicky. It's Brugazi, and I totally yeah. agree with that. But if you then look at the implications for the real economy, that amount of so-called money created, the only reason why they never had an impact on the real economy in terms of inflation is because they have never reached the real economy. Well, sometimes that, that I mean, that is something that happens. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't take an all or nothing approach to that, but you're right. I get like a, a significant percentage of the, what we're looking at right now stayed in the financial sector, which is kind of why you saw an inflation hit assets more than like commodities initially, or, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So that's a symptom. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a very complicated scenario, right? So there's a lot of different things going on, but yeah, I mean, I know, I know it's kind of, I guess I, I'm probably sounding like, uh, the, the greatest jerk on the planet right now counter well no uh, but, you know no, i'm you're basically made... contradicting every, everything you're saying but it... no you're what you're saying is like but you, can, you can see how um they're able to make a, a case for what they're doing right because with some of the things you, you're saying it's it's like it's not exactly obvious how detrimental it is because it's very complicated and you know you, you can make a a reasonable sounding argument in, in advocation for it, you know? So that's kind of the, a little bit of why it's able to persist, you know? Uh, because it is, it's one of the, it's very obscure, right? The issue is very obscure. It, it's intentionally yeah. that way. I, you know? I, I like to define it as, as the, their way to keep on, you know, kicking the can down the road, the proverbial, right, can down the road. 
because at a point they knew, I guess, that the, the system after after 08, the system wasn't able to to keep going the way it was going before, right? And you know how how can you kind of jumpstart the global economy? Yeah. So just um, I, I guess yeah. Just yeah, moving over to spy. Um, kind of you see that Fed's balance sheet. And if you were to map uh, the Fed's balance sheet, if you were to, instead of doing SPY to USD, because this is a SPY USD chart, if you were to do SPY and against the Fed's balance sheet as a trading pair, this would have never broken the uh, 07 highs. It would just be in a trading range ever since. Um, yeah. So essentially that's what, you know, what you see here. Um, you got the quarterly chart, you can go down to a monthly chart, but it, it's basically the same thing. Um, you know, and it, so it kind of begs the question is like, if you're getting, you know, if you want to short this, like, why would you want to short this market? It doesn't make sense. Um, no, it doesn't. Right. I mean, it's one of those things where like guys are predicting the top, right. And they've been predicting it for 12 years. And they'll probably be predicting it for 20 years. And one day they'll be right. But if you've been wrong every day of the year for 20 years, and then, and then you're right 20 years later, are you actually right? You know, I mean, it, it's one of those things, you know. Um, yeah, you're, pro you're probably broke uh, after six months of keep on doing the same game, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's, you know, you have but, these... you know, I mean, the I guess the the American stock market it's one of the really one of the much more misleading indicator if you wanna really have a pose on the real economy, right? Because it it is so disconnected from the real economy. The, I mean, I don't think this this chart this doesn't represent growth in the real economy. In terms of GDP or you know wages or wealth or whatever, at all. at all. And funnily enough, when you ask you know the average guy, how do you, what do you think about the U.S. economy? The the first thing they put up is the spy and the Nasdaq charts, and they say, well, oh, they're doing great. What this what this okay. chart represents is the Fed balance sheet. I mean, it's a direct. Correct corollary of the fed balance sheet i mean if you, you yeah know, at least if you were to the the spy graph is probably the most accurate representation in any chart of actual inflation like you're kind of looking at inflation on a on a price chart um there yeah you know there are two types of inflation maybe maybe there's the reason why we kind of circling around the same uh, concept because uh, I, I guess when people talk about inflation, they, they refer to uh, consumer prices, right? Um, but when I, usually when I do talk about inflation, I, I'm referring to monetary inflation. So what is going on in the monetary system in terms of collateral, right? So you, you, you can have deflationary currencies and inflationary currencies and everything is deemed in monetary terms. Uh, depending on what kind of monetary policies has been adopted. But if you then go out and look at uh, asset prices, then you're looking at values and data like CPI and whatnot. Okay? But you know, there is a dislocation there, I guess, because it, if you compare the, the two environments, you're going to have very different results. And I guess that, that's where the confusion can come in, you know. Yeah, I mean, they're the what you'd want to look at is the change in the money supply, right? Rather than the price of of goods, because the price of goods is tied to like thousands of variables, right? It can be impacted positively or yeah. negatively by thousands of different things. So it's just not a good yeah, generally, indicator of of inflation. I I think generally speaking, prices they they act like a sponge, right? If there is a lot of liquidity available, they're going to absorb it because this liquidity must go some, somewhere, right? 
Yeah, essentially. Yeah. I mean, you can think of another good so way to think about I, it is in rate oh, of change. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Right. So if one thing remains stable and the other changes mm -hmm. in units, then it's going to inflate. 